rounding out the kind of Jiro protective drug category is the final one we get asked about a lot, which is resveratrol. So where would you rank that and kind of how do you think about that compared to the three we've talked about so far? I have to be honest with you, I was really surprised when you guys sent me the list that resveratrol was on it because the implication is that it had been asked enough in that uh, survey we put out there that people wanted to hear it. And all I have to say is, wow, I'm amazed people are still talking about resveratrol. Um, this is absolute nonsense. So I'm, I'm, I'm just saying we're going to put this in the nonsense category and we never need to talk about this again. Um, I cannot, in other words, it's not just that the evidence, you know, there's not just an absence of evidence. There's actually evidence of absence here. So, um, resveratrol is a, is a phenol. It's a chemical that activates sirtuins. So understandably in all the early 2000s hoopla around sirtuins, um, which we just talked about a second ago, the view was like, oh my God, like sirtuins are good. They're repairing DNA damage. Um, resveratrol is an activator of sirtuins. That's got to be good. Away we go. Um, and so uh, a, a landmark study, quote unquote, in 2006 garnered an unbelievable amount of attention. Now, I think the attention was just as much from the fact that in minuscule amounts, resveratrol is found in red wine. Uh, it, it, so, you know, it's, it's, it wasn't just that, oh, we have another molecule that in some obscure mouse model maybe seems to extend life. I think it was, oh, and by the way, this molecule at about one one hundredth the level is found in red wine. On a serious level, is this an explanation for the French paradox, right? On a sort of clickbait level, does this mean we should just be drinking as much wine as possible? I, that's the only explanation, Nick, I have for why this story gathered traction and why it continues to this day to kind of cloud the judgment of, of folks. But um, as we have covered in great detail on the podcast, the first episode with Rich Miller, um, the 2006 mouse resveratrol study was was at best misinterpreted, right? So there there was indeed a longevity benefit um, but, uh, you know, it's a very obscure model, right? So it was a mouse model where the mice were fed a diet of 60% coconut oil. Um, I, I can't imagine what that would be like for 10 minutes, let alone for the duration of a mouse's life, especially when we consider mice are herbivores. So like, you know, that, that wouldn't be eating coconut oil, right? They're, they're not eating that much fat. Um, so so you you have these mice on 60% coconut oil diet uh, diet and the cause of death was uh so much fat accumulation in the liver that the liver expanded into the hemithorax and collapsed their lungs so again usually when we do experiments with mice they die based on their genetic predilection to die of cancer. And we're typically trying to ask the question, hey, you know, like in the case of rapamycin, like you give rapamycin to these mice, they get less cancer than these mice. Well, no, no, no. Here we're force feeding them coconut oil to turn their livers into big blobs of fat that expand into their chest and compress their lungs. And it turned out that under those conditions, um, there was a shorter time or a, I should say a longer time to death um, on average median lifespan um, if they were on resveratrol than if they were not. It turned out by the way there was no difference in maximal lifespan. So th you didn't shift the curve of mortality for the top 10% of mice, you just shifted it for the, for the, the, the median mice. Um, some, somehow that generated all of the interest in this drug and, and very few people paid attention when the ITP came along and said, we're going to study this really, really rigorously, right? We're going to study this in m mice that are not chronogenetic mutants, and we're not going to force feed them, you know, fat. We're going to give them normal mouse food and watch them die of normal mouse deaths. Um, and it made no difference. So they gave them 300 milligrams of resveratrol per kilo of food, which is 300 ppm. Again, just for comparison's sake, guys, wine is like 
less than two ppm parts per million of resveratrol. They're giving them 300 ppm um, and nothing happened. Now, the folks who say resveratrol works will have criticized that study saying the bioavailability is low and therefore you need much, much, much more than the 300 ppm uh, that was given in that study. Uh, but again, that was a concern and a criticism that was only voiced after the study. The proponents of resveratrol were involved in that study, um, and they signed off. I mean, they're they're on the paper. I mean, they they this was this was their view. So, um, I I just have a hard time believing that there is any value in resveratrol. Uh, and again, I you know that's why I don't take it. You know, independent of the fact that it's it's still a ubiquitous compound that's found everywhere. Thank you.